what I mean by the holographic principle. And what I mean is essentially what the holographic principle first meant. You have a region of space. Uh, a region of space means space cross time, and it has a boundary. There's a bulk inside it, a time-like boundary, in fact. This is a bulk inside it. It's described by all the various things that we describe bulks in terms of gravity, metric, action, Einstein-Hilbert action, Newtonian gravity it contains, contains black holes, Hawking radiation, all the things that we think should exist in the bulk. On the other side of the divide is the holographic theory, or the hologram, we can call it. Again, time-like spatial boundary, and on that time-like spatial boundary, there's a theory of some sort, which is purely quantum mechanical. It has a Hilbert space, it has unitarity, it has a Hamiltonian, it has things like entanglement, complexity, but it does not have gravity, at least not in its formulation, it doesn't contain gravity. Assumption of the holographic principle is that the right side can describe everything that's on the left side. Some examples that are very familiar to us, uh, matrix mechanics, matrix theory, which is a pure theory of the uh, quantum mechanics of matrices. On the right-hand side is 11-dimensional supergravity. Conformal field theory, ADS. SYK, JT gravity, and so forth. I wish I could say there were a lot more, but I don't know very many more. Uh, and notice the divide is a sharp divide between what is on one side, gravitational bulk physics, on the other side, sort of pure quantum mechanics. The concept does not propose that the cosmos is a simulated reality akin to the matrix, but rather suggests that despite our perception of a three-dimensional universe, it could potentially possess only two dimension. The concept is referred to as the holographic principle. The underlying concept is as follows. A remote two-dimensional surface encompasses all the necessary information to comprehensively depict our reality and akin to a hologram. This information is projected to manifest in three dimensions. Similar to the figures seen on a television screen, our existence is confined to a two-dimensional plane that merely appears to possess three-dimensional qualities. It may seem illogical, However, when physicists incorporate this assumption into their calculations, a wide range of significant physics issues, such as the characteristics of black holes and the harmonization of gravity and quantum mechanics, become considerably more manageable to resolve. Essentially, the rules of physics appear to be more coherent and comprehensible when expressed in a two-dimensional format rather than a three-dimensional one. What I actually want to talk about, let me just say in one particular uh, situation, one particular type of theory, which is called DSCFT, I want to explain which side of the divide this falls on. Is it a holographic theory? Is it a bulk theory? So let me just remind you very, very quickly, uh, at least this is uh, the description that Juan gave us. We have this inner space and we make some cut off at a very late time. Well, it doesn't have to be a very late time, a late time. And we describe the Wheeler-DeWitt wave function on that cutoff surface by a conformal field theory. The partition function of a conformal field theory involving a set of uh, operators A, those could be, we think of those as um, matter fields, a metric on the slice, not a bulk metric, but a metric on the slice that we slice off, and we construct parametrically in terms of the couplet, in terms of the uh, metric gij, we construct a Wheeler-DeWitt wave function. If we want to calculate anything from that Wheeler-DeWitt wave function, we have to square it and insert an operator of some sort. And that inevitably means in the end of the day, we'll be doing an integral over g, over the metric. 
the whole thing will have the look of a Euclidean quantum gravity problem with matter on a space-like D minus one sphere. I want to say, I'm going to say this is not a holographic theory, not in the sense in which I said it. It may be very powerful, extremely useful, certainly in the hands of one that was very useful in studying uh, features of inflation, but it is not what I mean. It's at best a hybrid of some kind of boundary theory and some kind of bulk theory. So I will not be speaking about uh, about this kind of um, this kind of theory. What is our best bet for a truly holographic theory of the sitter space? And the only alternative that I know is to have a holographic theory associated with each static patch. Okay, first question is where is the hologram? Now, when I say where is the hologram, I mean the same sense as we say the hologram for ADS is on the boundary. Next, what does the theory compute? In other words, what is the theory about? What do we know about the properties of a, of a uh, holographic description of a static patch? And finally, I want to talk about implementing the symmetries. Now, I may not get to all of this. I'll get to as much as I can. The symmetries that I'm talking about, incidentally, are very special symmetries for the sitter space. They take one static patch into another. Here I have, a, this is a picture of two, this is um, not the true Penrose diagram. It's, it's a doubled Penrose diagram, but that's not important. Here's the static patch associated with a particular, I don't know, we can call them a observer. And here's another static patch. And there must be transformations between these. Transformations between different static patches and also transformations which preserve the static patches are the symmetry of the sitter space. We would recognize the sitter space by implementing these particular symmetries. These symmetries are very difficult to implement. No, it's worse than that. They are impossible to implement. The holographic principle is a fundamental concept in string theories and quantum gravity, which posits that the information about a given volume of space can be fully represented on a lower dimensional boundary, such as a gravitational horizon. The concept was initially introduced by Gerard Hooft and later developed into a more precise interpretation within string theory by Leonard Susskind, who integrated his own ideas with those of Hooft and Charles Thorne. According to Leonard Susskind, the physical world that we perceive, which includes objects like galaxies, stars, planets, homes, stones, and people, can be understood as a hologram. This means that it is a representation of reality that is encoded on a remote, two-dimensional surface. Raphael Busso has highlighted that, in 1978, Thorne noticed that string theory allows for a description in lower dimensions, where gravity arises from it in a manner that can now be referred to as holographic. The ADS-CFT correspondence is a prominent illustration of holography. The holographic principle was derived from black hole thermodynamics, which postulates that the maximal entropy within a given region is proportional to the square of its radius rather than the expected cubic relationship. Regarding a black hole, it was discovered that the information contained in all the items that have been absorbed by the black hole may potentially be fully represented by the fluctuations occurring on the surface of its event horizon. The holographic principle provides a solution to the black hole information conundrum by incorporating it within the framework of string theory. Nevertheless, there are classical solutions to the Einstein equations that permit entropy values exceeding those permitted by an area law, proportional to the square of the radius, therefore potentially surpassing the entropy of a black hole. These are the bags of gold referred to as Wheeler's bags. The presence of these solutions contradicts the holographic interpretation and their implications in a quantum theory of gravity that incorporates the holographic principle are still not completely comprehended. 
But there was a problem because when a black hole evaporates, the information contained within any object that may have been engulfed by it appears to also vanish. Leonard Susskind and Dutch physicist Gerard Hooft suggested a solution in the mid-90s, which posits that when an object is drawn into a black hole, it creates a 2D impression on the event horizon. Subsequently, as radiation emanates from the black hole, it acquires the distinctive characteristics of this information. In this way, the information remains intact. According to their computations, it was determined that the two-dimensional surface of a black hole has the capacity to contain sufficient information to fully characterize any three-dimensional objects that appear to be within it. The second concern is the problem of entropy. Additionally, there was the associated issue of quantifying the entropy within a black hole, which refers to the level of chaos and unpredictability among its constituent particles. In the 1970s, Jacob Bekenstein determined that the entropy of black holes is limited, and this limit is directly proportional to the two-dimensional area of the event horizon of a black hole. In the context of conventional matter systems, it has been observed that the entropy is directly related to the volume rather than the area. This observation has led to the hypothesis that a black hole, which appears to be a three-dimensional phenomenon, could be better comprehended by considering only two dimensions. None of these provided evidence supporting the hypothesis that black holes were holograms. Physicists have acknowledged that considering the entire cosmos as a two-dimensional entity that appears three-dimensional could potentially offer solutions to certain fundamental issues in theoretical physics. The mathematical principles apply equally to black holes, planets, and entire universes. In 1998, Juan Maldacena provided evidence for the existence of a hypothetical universe that can be represented as a hologram. The hypothetical universe he referred to exists in anti-de Sitter space, characterized by a curved shape at vast distances, in contrast to our flat universe. In addition, through the examination of this universe from a two-dimensional perspective, he discovered a method to reconcile the growingly popular concept of string theory which posits that the fundamental constituents of the universe are one-dimensional strings rather than particles, with the firmly established principles of particle physics. Furthermore, his achievement lies in the consolidation of two highly significant and distinct concepts in physics under a single theoretical framework. The holographic principle established a connection between the theory of gravity and theories of particle physics. The integration of these two fundamental concepts into a unified theory, commonly referred to as quantum gravity, continues to be a major objective in the field of physics. The holographic principle's feasibility in this imaginary cosmos was highly significant. Naturally, it is important to note that the aforementioned statement is significantly distinct from asserting that our current reality, as opposed to the hypothetical one mentioned, is a hologram. However, recent theoretical research indicates that the holographic principle could potentially apply to our universe as well. Physicists have conducted calculations to determine how these theories would forecast the level of entanglement, which is a peculiar quantum phenomenon where the states of two minuscule particles can become linked, causing a modification in one particle to impact the other, even if they are distant from each other. Through the examination of a certain model of a flat world as a hologram, it was discovered that the outcomes of both theories may be successfully aligned. However, despite the little proximity of this scenario to our universe compared to Maldukina's, it only represents a certain form of flat space. Moreover, their calculations neglected the dimension of time and just focused on the three special dimensions. Furthermore, even if this were directly applicable to our universe, it would merely indicate the potentiality of it being a hologram. It would not constitute conclusive evidence. First of all, 
anything that could be outside a black hole could also be inside a black hole. The whole civilization, the whole solar system, the whole works. If a black hole was big enough, it could contain all of that. So on the one hand, there's no limitation on what can be inside a black hole. Anything could be inside the black hole. If the black hole is big enough, then that anything, the civilization, the solar system, and all of it, has to be also described by these little bits of information that get plastered onto the horizon of the black hole. But uh, when I was thinking about it, this was sometime around 1993, 1994, Gerard Tuft was also thinking a lot about it. We were thinking also partially about um, cosmology. Now, I was somebody who tended to believe that there was a cosmological constant in nature and that the universe was expanding or accelerated expansion. And if it is accelerated expansion, the universe is described by something that's called the sitter space. The sitter space is a very interesting thing. It's almost like an inside-out black hole. We are in the inside and out at a certain distance away, 15, 20 billion light years away, there's a horizon. And things fall out. They don't fall into the black hole. They fall out from our universe out through that horizon. It's like an inside-out black hole, but don't get the idea that it means that we're inside a black hole. It doesn't. It means that the universe itself is, as I said, like an inside-out black hole, and things fall out through the horizon. I began to think, wait a minute, there's something going on here. What if the horizon of the sitter space is similar to the horizon of a black hole? And mathematically it is. Mathematically it's almost identical. Then that must mean that everything that's on the inside of the universe must be describable as a hologram or a kind of film on the surface way out there at the horizon of the sitter space. That's the way I was thinking about it. Gerard was thinking about it a little bit different. Uh, but together we came together with this notion that everything within a region of space can be described as if there was it was surrounded by a film where that film was, uh, was like a hologram. Nobody really took this too seriously at first. I took it seriously, but nobody really took it seriously except for a very handful of people. Ed Witten was one of them. Uh, Juan Maldacena was one of them. The reason it really became consensus science was because a very, very particular kind of space-time, anti sitter space, don't worry about what it means exactly. It wasn't the, it wasn't the space that was discovered by the sitter's ant. It's another kind of space. Anti sitter space has the property that it has a kind of boundary. And it's a very special space with an enormous amount of symmetry, very amendable to mathematical uh, analysis. String theory had a lot to say about it. And by the time Juan Maldacena got his hands on it, he was able to prove very, very rigorously that this holographic idea was correct within that context. Once that happened, everybody jumped and said, oh, this holographic idea must be right. And uh, that's the status of it now. The difference is that the kind of experiments that you would have to do to confirm it are so difficult and so way out there beyond the range of our technology getting close enough to a black hole to be able to see the Hawking radiation from it, cooling the black hole to the point of view where it does radiate, all sorts of things that you would need to do to turn this into experimental science are not fundamentally impossible, but they are way beyond the range of our technology. And they'll probably always be beyond the range of our technology. So it's it's not clear to me how it will ever become experimental science and i think that's very important um but as far as theoretical science as far as theoretical physics goes i think it has already achieved the level of being a um, a basic principle and i don't think that's going to go away an optimal kind of evidence would commence with a verifiable forecast derived from holographic theory Subsequently, experimental physicists might collect empirical data to ascertain its conformity with the theoretical prediction. For example, the Big Bang theory hypothesized the existence of residual energy spreading across the cosmos due to the explosive expansion that occurred 13.8 billion years ago. In the 1960s, scientists indeed discovered this energy 
known as the cosmic microwave background radiation. Currently, there is no universally accepted test that would offer conclusive evidence for the concept. Nevertheless, certain physicists maintain the belief that the holographic principle posits a constraint on the quantity of information that can be contained within space-time. This is due to the notion that our apparently three-dimensional space-time is actually represented by finite quantities of two-dimensional information. The researchers are use a device known as a holomotor to detect this type of visual distortion. It utilizes high-powered lasers to determine if there is a fundamental restriction in the quantity of information contained within space-time at extremely small submicroscopic scales. If such an existence is confirmed, it might potentially serve as proof supporting the hypothesis that our reality is a holographic projection. However, other physicists, like as Leonard Susskind, refute the underlying assumption of this experiment and argue that it is incapable of yielding any substantiating proof for the holographic principle. In our everyday existence, we typically do not give much consideration to the intriguing and counterintuitive reality that we inhabit a holographic universe. However, this revelation would be a significant advancement in comprehending the fundamental principles of physics, which govern every single activity you have ever performed.